Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. You are my light and my salvation. You restore me and lead me for your glory. I long to dwell in your house forever. Well, good morning, church. I wish uh, you could just be up here at the front and listen to the worship this morning. You were doing an amazing job of worshiping God. Uh, it, just, it just blessed my I actually forgot I was supposed to preach. Uh, I got caught in the moment. Thank you for being here this morning. I want to invite you to open your copy of God's Word to Psalm 65. My name is Perry Walker. I'm your missions director. And uh, it's such an honor this morning to be able to look at this beautiful Psalms. When we're between series and Pastor John preaching, many times we've been working our way through the Psalms. We're made our way all the way up to Psalm 65. And so that's where we're at right now. And so I have the honor and the blessing of teaching and, and sharing this morning from this beautiful Psalms. Our prayer is that just God would speak to us through this psalm. Are you finding your place there in scripture? Amen. Beautiful psalms this morning. Let me ask you a question. How big is your God? How big is your God? Sometimes, let's just be honest, the struggles in life, the distractions of life can feel so big that often there is a temptation to believe that God can't handle it. That We feel like we have big problems and a small God. This psalm reminds us we have a big God, and when we get our minds wrapped around how big this God is, it is going to put your life in perspective. That's my prayer this morning. Amen? Well, this is a special time of the year. I love springtime. It's, uh, it's just one of my favorite times of the year. Everything is coming back to life. Grass is greener. Trees, just overnight, the leaves come out on the trees. The days are longer. What I like about summer is everybody seems nicer. You know, they just are, they're just nicer people. And, uh, and uh, they say thank you and please a little bit more. It's just a good time of the year. If you're a nature lover or a tree hugger, this is your Psalms. This is, this is a Psalm about nature. Psalm 65 is a beautiful hymn of praise that acknowledges God's goodness, provision, and, and, and in the particular context of nature. It's a Psalm penned by David, and uh, it just speaks to God's provision in our life. It's, it is blessing God for what he has given us. Psalm 65, we see David Here, he's going to talk about God's grace, God's might. He's going to tell us about God's blessings in humanity. This was a worship song, a worship psalm. It was sung many times, or it could have been sung after a season of drought, and all of a sudden the rains come. But more than likely, because of the wording in the Psalms, there is a reference to keeping vows to God, to worshiping God in in Zion. We're going to read that. More than likely, this Psalm was used during the Feast of the Tabernacles. That was an eight-day time of celebration at the end of a harvest season. And here the the people would sing this hymn in their worship services and their praise for God for the the harvest that God had bring because it is is a harvest, a plentiful harvest, a harvest that God brings. It's this particular Psalm, Psalm 65, is one of only three Psalms that have the word atone or atonement in it which is the idea of atonement is God covering our sin, God redeeming us, God atoning for our sin. This Psalms, Psalms 78 and 79 are the three only Psalms that have that word in them. This is a beautiful reminder to give God glory and that we can pray to God for both our spiritual and our physical needs. He is a God that meets us at the point 
of our needs. So let me just begin by reading this morning. And we're in Psalm 65, and we're just going to break this up. The psalm naturally is divided into three sections, and we're just going to take them one at a time and, uh, and work our way through them. So Psalm 65, verses 1 through 4, praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and you sh shall keep, and to you shall vows be performed. O oh, you who hear prayers, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against you, you atone for our transgression. Blessed is the one you choose to bring near, to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, with the holiness of your temple. David begins here in verse 1 and declaring that praise and, and worship belong to the God of Zion, and Zion being that, that Jerusalem, that holy place. And he's talking about here to the nation of Israel. It speaks to the nation of Israel. And if all we had was verse one, we would think that this is a Psalms really for the Hebrews and for Jerusalem. But verse two expands that and it begins to, to, to draw our worship. It says that it is a worship of praise and it basically says of all people. Look what it says there. Oh, you who hear prayer to you shall all flesh come. This Psalm is an expression of a universal need for God. Wherever you are in the world, wherever, you're, wherever you were born, wherever your geography is from, this psalm is saying you need God. All peoples of the earth, not just the Jewish people, not just the Hebrew people, all must come to God. The truth is that this psalm is teaching us, first, that God hears our prayers and he forgives us even though we don't deserve it. I find great comfort in that. And knowing that when I pray and communicate with God, he hears my prayer. In verse 3, David describes the root of the problem of humanity. We know it is sin. Look what he says here in verse 3. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. We all are experts on the subject of sin. So we understand what he's talking about. David was feeling the weight of his sin, his iniquities. And he says, it is God who atones for that. Notice that David didn't say that animal sacrifices were atoning for the sin, even though there was a sacrificial system in place. David knew better than that. He knew that the blood of animals could not pay for the sin of humanity. And so he, he understood that. Notice what he says. He says, it is God who is covering over the people's sin. Here David is declaring later on what Paul would talk about in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 5. But God being rich in mercy became the, because of his great love for us which we loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We're reminded here. That it is God that brings salvation. It is God who covers our sin. That the sacrifice of animals, our efforts and our desires and our, our, our working it out is never enough. It is God who atones for our sin. I remember as a young man when I came to Christ, my experience was I had chosen to follow God. And that was true from my perspective. But anybody that has ever given their heart to Jesus Christ and become a full follower of Jesus Christ and surrendered to him, they know that no sooner than you thought you had chose that, you realize that God had chosen you and been calling you out and setting aside the circumstances of your life. And you see that it is God who pursues us. Here we see that the people needed a savior. And God continued to show mercy towards the people by covering their sin. But let's just be honest. To be justified before God, to receive his favorable treatment, 
Something had to happen. And that was the death of Jesus Christ. It's really not until we get to the New Testament that we understand how radical the grace of God really is. I love the Old Testament. I love reading the stories. I love reading how God is at, and I read through those pages and I see the grace of God in there. But it is when I come to the New Testament that I see how radical that grace is. It is through the death of Christ, God's perfect sacrifice, that atonement for our sin was made once and for all. We have been saved. We have been saved from the penalty of sin and our sins are forgiven in Christ. Amen? We rest in that. But there is a blessing that comes from God. This, these are blessings that come from God. Not only is our sin forgiven, but the Bible declares here in this passage in the Psalms that we're at, that as a redeemed people, we are brought near to God. Look what it says in verse 4. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your court. Salvation is not just the forgiveness of my sin. If that's all that salvation was, then the moment I sin again, I would be in trouble. Salvation is the forgiveness of our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that. We live in that. But it's more than that. Salvation actually is also a change in how God sees me. How I relate to God and how he relates to me. Now we see in this passage that we are drawn to God. He changes how he sees us. Our relationship with God has changed. And now as redeemed, we can live in his presence. Amen. Listen, to live in the presence of God is an incredible thing. I remember one of my first trips to the country of Haiti. No sooner than we arrived in Port-au-Prince, we stopped at an orphanage. And there at the orphanage, we began to be introduced to some children and we began to hear their stories and our hearts were overwhelmed. We also heard how God had called this beautiful lady, a servant of the Lord, to go and minister and rescue these children who had been stricken with disease and left for dead. As the children began to soak in our love and our presence, these children began, we began to cry and just watching these children. We were overcome with the goodness of God. We felt the presence of God. We felt the provision of God for these children and for our own lives. It was an incredible moment. While there was great need around us in that country, God's presence was enough in the life of these children. I remember praying that day for our, the team and for these children. I remember praying that, that God would just to thank him and that now I know what it means to have my cup overflow. Has your cup ever overflowed because of the presence of the Lord in your life? The abundance, that's what this Psalms is talking about. Listen, God's presence is enough Amen. when you're going through difficult days. We as Christians, we should be humble because our salvation is by grace. We did not earn it, the Bible says. We should be holy and loving because our salvation is costly and yet to God, and yet it cost us nothing. We should be at peace because the Bible says that our salvation is enough. It satisfies. We should be grateful because this salvation secures us a place at the table where we can be satisfied in the presence of God because God's provision is in his presence. Amen? I prayer, my prayer this morning for you is that, that you this morning in the presence of God, that your need would be met and that you would experience God in his fullness. And that would be satisfying in your life. We see in this passage too, and that we are to proclaim 
the God of might. In Psalm 65, verses 5 through 8, we read, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God, and of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and the furth seas, the one who by his strength establishes the mountains, being girded with might. So still the roaring seas, roaring of the waves, the trumpet of the people, so that those who dwell in the ends of the earth are in awe of your sight. Signs. You make the going out and the mo- of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. This second section of this psalm is speaking all about the power and the might of this Lord, of this of God. This is an incredible display of the power of God on the earth. The passage itself in verse six points out two examples. The first being, he notice what he says, the one who has, has his strength establishes the mountains being girded with might. It's saying that God is the creator of the earth. He's the creator of the mountains and his power is on display. His might is on display in these beautiful mountains. If you've ever climbed a mountain, I had the experience of climbing with two of my sons in Quito, Ecuador one time on a mountain. And I'll just be honest with you, that mountain kicked my tail. I got about halfway up that mountain of about 10 hours of walking and my legs give out and uh, and I couldn't make it to the top. The mountain was too big. The reality is we don't move mountains. We do our best just to tunnel through edges of the mountains. They are huge and they are majestic. And if you have ever stood on top of a mountain, you understand how powerful and majestic they really are. God has put mountains on the earth to to remind us of his power and his might, the Bible says. The second example we see here in verse seven, who steals the roaring seas, the roaring of the waves. The waves of the ocean are fascinating. When you consider their power, if you've ever went and saw the ocean or stood in the ocean and the waves start rolling in, you know that they can almost knock you down just standing, just not even very deep at all. They are, they are powerful. The ocean is the, oh, the waves can, they can take rocks and turn them into sand. They can reshape a coastline. The waves can take our largest ship and just toss it around like it's a toy, the bu- Here we see that why does the the psalmist record these events of nature, the mountains and the roaring sea? Verse eight tells us why. It's so that we are in awe of the signs of God. They tell us, they remind us to seek God. We've all had that experience if you've been out in nature. When you're looking at a sunset you're looking at a mountain or watching the waves roll in and you're overwhelmed with the fact that we have a creator and that he created this beautiful place for us because he loved us. And it speaks to the awesomeness and the power of God. Notice in verse five what it says, by awesome deeds you answer us. He's talking about prayer with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth to the farthest seas. These things, the ocean and the mountains, they remind us of the, the fact that God answers our prayers. God hears our prayers. God can meet our need. God can bring salvation. These are monuments to the power of God. Let me ask you, did you come this morning with a prayer on your heart? Did you come with a need? I can tell you with assurance that God, the God who created the mountains, he can meet you at the point of that need. David is telling us that the, to, to look at the earth and see God can be, can be trusted. He has the power and the might to work in us and through us. I also know that it's very easy when we're going through difficult times 
to be so absorbed in our own troubles that we do not see that all that God is doing around us and around the world. But this Psalms reminds us, look what it says in verse five. It tells us that the God who holds the sea in the palm of his hand is the hope of all the ends of the earth. God's salvation began with a man and his family named Abraham out to the Hebrews. But then through Jesus Christ, we see that God's plan and mission to redeem a lost world moves farther than that. And God is on a mission. He takes his, his gospel, he takes his work across boundaries of nation, races, language, geographical locations. God is the God of all nations, is what this psalm declares. God blesses his people, and he blesses his people to reach all peoples. That's what we believe here at Henderson Hills. We believe that God has blessed us. We have the gospel. We have the word of God. We can come together in freedom and worship. We worship with our families. We, we, we have beautiful services. We are a blessed people. But God blesses his people so that he can reach all people. This week, we have a team of volunteers from our church going out to North Wells. They're going to be led by Jennifer Monsieur. She's going to be leading that team and going to a country of Wells where once they were evangelized, once they had the gospel, there were, there's huge church buildings over there. But from one generation not reaching the next, it is a country that is lost now and the churches, the large church is 20 people. And Jennifer's taking teams over there and they're going to be ministering to those people in Wells. We have teams going to Colombia, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Asia, Japan, Canada. Folks, we are busy. And we are sending out people to the nations here at Henderson Hills. This morning, we have had a church that we have worked with in Brussels for years. The pastor's name is Mike. His wife's name is Tina. This morning, they are baptizing six new believers, and all six are six different nationalities. Amen. We have a God who is a God of the nations. He is a God for everybody. This next Sunday on June the 2nd, we're going to be having a, a future missions lunch. You've been seeing that promoted. But it is a time where you can come and hear about all of these trips. It's a time where you can join God in his mission to reach the earth. I hope you'll come. I hope you'll participate in that. This afternoon, from three to five, we have an open house. You probably didn't even know this, but we have mission houses. And we have a mission houses where missionaries come and they can furlough. And we just remodeled our mission house. It's a beautiful work. Jen George did a great job with that. Everybody contributed. It was an amazing achievement. We hope you'll, this afternoon, drop by from three to five and just look at this, because this house is going to be used for missionaries to come while they're on furlough and rest, fellowship with us, tell their story, and find ways that we can come alongside of them and bless them on their fields around the world. This is strategic. It's important. And we ask God to bless this. We hope you'll be part of that. This psalm reminds us that we have a God of all the nations. The last part of this psalm is going to be talking about that we need to trust in the God of blessings. Look what it says. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The rivers of God are full of water. You provide their grain for you are preparing it. You water it with furrows abundantly, settling the ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth, the crown of the year with your bounty. You, your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. 
The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The, the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout a song together for joy. You get the picture? It's a picture of abundance. God himself cares for the world that he has made. God is not out of touch with his world. He is not outdated. He is participating in his world, he says. It comes down and he waters it, the writer says. He waters the land of the crop. David is declaring it's God himself who comes and visits the earth, who waters the earth. He takes the ridges and softens them. He softens the ground with the rain so that the farmer can put in the seed and then that there is abundant harvest. It is God himself who is actively blessing us. It is not by our own hands. It is not by our technology. It's not by our creativity. We only thrive and are sustained because God is doing it. We sang this morning, every breath. But do we really believe that? I tell you what, I had the privilege of working as a hospital for almost nine years as a chaplain and set by people every day that struggled for the next breath. And they learned really quick that it's by God's grace that the next breath comes. This is a God who is in our creation, who is working in our lives, a God who can be trusted. He's also a God who has made it profitable. Look what it says in verse 11. He's describing the harvest. He says, the harvest that people enjoy because God has made the earth profitable. It is, it is, it's interesting to me as I travel all the different kinds of foods that really happen because there's all these different kinds of soil in the earth. God is an amazing God. He, he, he does all of this. I don't know if you realize it or not, but um, in Peru, for example, Peru boasts of over 4,000 potato variations. Now, now, I know what you're thinking right now. I thought there was only two, mashed and, and baked, Right? But, but there's actually 4,000 varieties of potatoes in Peru. They're, they're farmed in the Andean region of Peru, ranging from purple to pink to blue to red varieties. And here's the point. This is not just some random chance. This is a God who by design and activity in his creation has created diversity and different soils and different plants. The Andean people know that if you get too much rain one year, only these potatoes grow. If you don't have any rain that year, only these potatoes grow. But the truth is they know they will always have food because God thought of that. God is an incredible God and he is active in this earth and he made this earth and he brings a harvest to the people. Psalm 65 reminds us that God is bringing a harvest, not only of abundance and provision for us, but a harvest of souls of people around the world. The key to understanding this last section has to do with the abundance of the harvest. Look at it just very briefly. In verse 9, you greatly enrich it, it says. The rivers of God are full of water. Do you catch the language? Verse 10, the water in its furrows abundantly. You crown, verse 11, you crown the years with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The picture here is that the harvest is so great that the grain on the cart is falling off of the harvest and it's filling the wagon tracks and nobody's even going back to pick it up because of the abundance of God, the blessings of God. God blesses us abundantly. Every day I watch TV, it tells me I don't have enough and I deserve more. But when I read this book, I see God telling me, I have made provision for you. It is enough and be grateful, and be generous. I look at this passage and I realize that God is not a stingy God with the things of this earth. 
He is a blessed God who gives us, and God is overflowing with his blessings on us. And we are to be grateful for that. This is a beautiful Psalms. And it speaks to our relationship to God. It speaks of our world. It speaks of God's mission to redeem the world. But it also speaks to us. Let me ask you the question once more. How big is your God? Maybe you're here today. And you're feeling tossed around in a roaring sea of life. And you're thinking to yourself, it is out of control and it is hopeless. Maybe you're even asking yourself, can God help? Can God even hear my prayers? And I'm here to tell you, based on the word of God, that the God who spoke the mountains into existence hears your prayer, and can do something about it. Jesus, when he was with his disciples, was in a storm one night, and he got up from his sleep, and he walked out and looked at the storm in the life of his disciples, and then he looked at the storm over the sea, and all he did was say two words, be quiet, be still, and the wave ceased. And listen, if Jesus can say two words and calm a sea, In his power and in his love, he can speak into your life and he can make a difference. Maybe you're here today and you're feeling the weight of your sin. David said it this way, our iniquities continue to prevail against us. We're heavy from that load. We are living in ways that we should not live. All of us sin, the Bible says, and fall short of the holiness and the glory of God. But God, rather than issue wrath on us, he makes provision for us. God is merciful, the Bible says, and he covers our sin that we have committed because he loves us. But God is not just a loving God. He is a holy and a just God. And his justness must be satisfied. And the Bible says that out of that sense of justice, just like a judge on the bench could be merciful, but he has to be fair. He has to be just. He has to follow the law. God in his mercy and in his justice, he, he, he pays the price for our sin. And the Bible says the price was the sacrificial death of his son. God loved us enough that he sent his only son to die for us, to redeem us, to cover us, to change his relationship with us. So it satisfies his justice and it's motivated out of his love. And all we do is come to him. The atonement is found, our salvation is found in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that this psalm is calling us to God to repent and to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ as our only Lord and Savior, the provision that God has made. And then with all of our might, with every cell in our body, with every minute on our clock, with every resource in our pocket, with every strength of we have in our muscles to live and praise God because he is our savior and he is our sustainer. Amen.